Hey there, welcome to Toy Talk with Mike and Chad, episode 35. I'm Mike. I'm Chad. And the toys that we're going to talk about today, I've got just a couple set aside here. So when you showed up here today, I told you that I had a few episodes to talk about. Um, we just recorded an episode with our G.I. Joes. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I want to talk about now is normally we talk about just toys. Yep. Although we do sometimes dabble in movies and comic books. I figured today, because you and I have seen a bunch of movies together. Yes. In just the past like two or three weeks, we've seen like all the nerdy movies. So I figured maybe we could take, I don't know, five, ten minutes to talk about each of our movies. Sure. And talk about the toys related to them, because I bought a toy, sort of, related to each of the movies. Okay. So maybe we'll start with, the, I think, the first one we saw... Was, was it Across the Spider-Verse? Or across across the Across the Spider-Verse. So I have Spider-Punk. So after we talk about the movie, I'll splice in kind of a closer review of this figure. But, uh, yeah. What did you think of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse? <clears throat> I thought it would be really difficult to beat the first one. Yeah. Um, the first one just had so much new stuff in it like animation style and like the music fit the movie very well um seeing this one i was kind of on the fence afterwards i had quite a few questions about it um a few days later though i i really enjoyed it and i would probably go see it again in imax yeah i after i saw it, that was one of my first things i thought i was like man i kind of want to see this again in imax like right away and I guess I should start this by saying we're probably going to talk about spoilers because most of these movies will have been it's out been for like a month for yeah, this one. Now. But some of the movies that we like, Flash, we're going to talk about that just came out last week. But by the time I post this, it'll probably be two weeks ago. So anyway, um, yeah, I really liked it a lot, and I liked the first Spider Verse movie okay, but it didn't like blow my mind. I was like, I thought the animation was original, and I'm glad that it won Best Picture, Best Animated Picture. I thought it deserved it. But I wasn't, like, dying to see it again or anything like that. So I don't know if I even would have went to see this in theaters, if not for you Mm -hmm. saying, let's go see it. And uh, I was kind of blown away by it. Not so much the storyline. Yeah. But the the animation. And maybe I need to rewatch the first one. Maybe I'm not remembering it for as good as it was. I remember it was good and it was original. But watching this one, it was, like, a whole other level. I think they've elevated the animation so far beyond the first one. And, like, I I went to animation school. Yeah. Like, so I have some animation background. And, uh, like, when I went to school, if we're talking, like, around, ni- it was 1998, 99 when I went to animation school. So 3D animation was pretty limited at the time. And, you know, but when you saw things like Toy Story and Bugs Life, I understood it. That, you know, that audiences might not really think about this sort of stuff, but why did they do toys and bugs it's because those things are segmented yeah. and it's easy to show, you know, move their elbows because you can show a joint, you know, because it was very hard to do fluid, you know, one solid arm. So that was the kind of thing I had a little bit more insight into because I was doing the animation myself. And doing things like hair was like really tough to mm-hmm. do. And then when Monsters Inc. came out, you're like, holy crap, how did they make this big hairy guy look so believable? And uh, so watching this Spider-Man movie, it was like that the whole time. I was like, how did they do this? It's like, this is insane. Yeah, even the level of like mixed media that was in there. Like some of the things, they had a sequence where um, we are doing spoilers. Yep. Yeah, they had a sequence where it went to a Lego Spider-Man universe and they used the actual Daily Bugle Lego building that you can buy, which I yeah. also want to get, but... Like, that was fantastic, and seeing Lego Spider-Man, and I've seen pictures, I have a friend that has the Daily Bugle, and yeah, like, he told me it's at least four feet tall, because his son is almost taller than this thing. Wow. So it's incredible to see that, and, like, I like that J. Jonah was the same across all the the Spider-Verses, which, yeah, it's nice. And that's it, like, there was so many little Easter eggs and stuff, and, like, I'm not, we're not going to get into all that mm-hmm. here. There's other videos that are totally devoted to Easter eggs and talking about all the different Spider-Man that appeared. But, like, one of them 
was like Ben Riley the Scarlet Spider. Yeah. And I'm a big Ben Riley Scarlet Spider fan. I was happy to see him. However, he is a character that they've been kind of doing a bit of a character assassination on him every time he shows up. Um, he came back from... Because he died at, back in the 90s at the end of the clone saga where he was introduced. He was around for about four years as Spider-Man's clone. Then he died. We didn't see him for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And then they brought him back and they made him a bad guy. And then they brought him back again and made him kind of a dick. And then they brought him back again. Now he's a bad guy again. And every time they bring Ben Riley back, I'm a little disappointed with how they portray him. In this one, they made him like super emo for some reason. Yeah. And... I don't think that's what he was like in the comic books. Like, I think they were maybe just making fun of the era of comic books, but, like, Ben Riley was not a super mopey character like that. So I didn't love that portrayal. But at the same time, this isn't... I, I didn't get Ben out of shape about it the same way I do when they mischaracterized him in the comic books, which I consider, you know, the one true universe. Yeah. This is an adaptation of it. If they want to change his personality, I don't really care that much. But I thought he looked incredible because they had him... He looked like the comic book art, like, truly come to life. Which is uh, one thing, like, whenever, you know, DC does those animated movies that are really well done. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that comes to mind, one of the early ones they did was Public Enemies, Superman, yeah. Batman, which was based on a comic book by Jeff Loeb with art by one of my favorite artists, Ed McGuinness. Mm -hmm. And Ed McGuinness draws these characters in a very unique way. Yep. They're big and muscular and very cartoony. And yet, when they made it an animated special, they couldn't make it look like Ed McGuinness's artwork. They tried; like it's got similarities, but you have to make the you have to make it cleaner, you know, because it's easier for animators. You, you can't put too many lines and stuff yeah. in things. Same as when they adapt work by Frank Miller, they try to change the look, but they definitely do, doesn't look like Frank Miller no. drew this animation. Awesome. And yet, with Scarlet Spider, he looked like the comic book artist. He had cross hatching. He had like. I was like, how did they do that? They took him right out of the comic book and he's moving around on screen and said he looks like a comic book. Like, I've never seen them so faithfully adapt the artwork. It makes me think that this cre this uh, animation studio could probably take like a Frank Miller book like The Dark Knight mm -hmm. and make it look exactly like Frank Miller's artwork yeah. and not make it a weird motion comic where it's not really moving, but actually animate it. And again, I was super impressed by that. Um... So yeah, it looked really cool. But my favorite thing about it was Spider-Punk. And that was... I did not expect it. Because Spider-Punk was introduced in the comic books years ago now. At the first time they did a Spider-Verse story. And they introduced all these Spider-Men from different universes. Including Spider-Gwen who has gone on to become like mm -hmm. super popular in her own right. So they introduced... Spider-Punk, which was from an alternate universe where Hobie Brown, who in the regular Marvel Universe is the Prowler, um, but for whatever reason, Hobie Brown became Spider-Punk in his universe, and they did like a one-shot comic book about him, which I wasn't super impressed by. He's shown up again once or twice, nothing exciting. They made a Marvel Legends action figure of him a while ago, and I bought it, and it's okay. It's basically Spider-Man with a bit of a spiky mohawk and sneakers and a jean jacket, I was like, that is all the Spider-Punk I need. I saw these figures were coming out, and there was another Spider-Punk. I had zero interest in picking it up, because not only do I already have him, and he's kind of a stupid character, but they're done in the animation style, which doesn't really yeah. match my Marvel Legends collection. So, zero interest. But the way they animated him, and the way they characterized him in the movie, he was awesome. I did not expect to like him at all. But he was like... He felt like truly punk like they didn't mm -hmm. it wasn't like some goofy writer that doesn't understand what punk is and just like oh let's make him like avril lavigne or something it's like no he was modeled after like you know sex pistols punk he was british yeah which in the comic books i don't remember if he was supposed to be british but it's very hard to portray because you don't get an accent in comic books but hearing him speak with that british accent and when he was on screen he never looked like this crisp in colors no, he was he it's like he was a living gig poster <clears throat> It's like, like if you think of the cover to the Sex Pistols, never mind the Bullocks album, it's kind of like torn paper and stuff on it. Like, that's what his whole body was like. It was like constantly moving. It's like when you walk by a street pole in the middle of the city with like weeks worth of papers, like ads for bands stapled all mm -hmm. over one another. He was like a living pile of, I, like I can't even really describe it. It was, it was Nostalgia. 
But he was incredible to look at. Yeah. And I thought he was super funny in the movie. I thought he was cool in the movie. When he took his mask off, I loved his crazy hair. Yeah, it was like a Jimi Hendrix style hair. Or almost more like the, the how the weekend used to have his yeah, crazy yeah. hair. Like all over um, I really wish he had an old like an unmasked head. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um but after seeing it, I was like, I want this version of Spider Punk. Because when I went back and looked at the one I had in the sneakers, I'm like, he seems totally lame. No wonder I didn't like Spider Punk. This guy, he's got his own vibe going. Uh, he's got a lot of cool detail on him. His guitar is covered in stickers and stuff. I think this figure is actually really awesome. It poses really well. I like the eyes. Yeah, he's got like, it's almost like bleeding down. Like he's got like yeah. mascara on or something. He's really cool. I do worry that he could break because his arms are really spindly. Um, but yeah, he looks great, and it was based on the movie alone. I had yeah. zero interest in this figure until uh, I saw the movie, and then I had to have this. So yeah, the movie, I thought it was pretty cool. Storyline is a little convoluted. You guys probably all know this by now, but it ends very abruptly at a cliffhanger. That doesn't bother me. Um, I didn't know that was happening going in, but when it happened, I was like, okay. Sure. Like, We're going to get another one. We'll get another one. We'll wrap up the storyline. It didn't bother me. Um, it's It didn't feel like when they do that with things like Hunger Games or Harry Potter where it feels forced to split it up to milk us for more money. Like the movie was already like over two hours. It was like two hours and 18 minutes or something. Yeah. So if they wanted to play that story out, it would have been a four hour movie in it. I thought it worked. I didn't really feel like the movie felt bloated. I, I liked everything that was in there. So yeah. Th- thumbs up for me. Yeah, I would definitely give it a thumbs up. I have many of the same uh, compliments about the movie. I, on the other hand, was super annoyed with the ending because what time show did we go to? That was a that was a late night show. It was ten o'clock. It's I think. always it's always late night shows with you. It, it is always late night shows. So it was like, yeah, it was like a ten ten thirty show. I think it was, and you know, I had a long day at work, and then. I was already annoyed, and then this, like, when it got to about the two-hour mark, I'm like, I know there's only, like, 20 minutes left, so they really got to pick this up, or something's got to happen, and then just how it ended so abruptly, it really pissed me off. I see why they did it now, and... Yeah, and at the same time, like, because in the the movie, like, the spot is the bad guy, but you could kind of argue that Spider-Man 2099 is the bad guy. But it's not like it got to two and a half hours and they said, he still has to beat these bad guys. It's like they yeah. threw a curveball and you've got like a whole new villain showing up at the yeah. end. So it makes sense it to be a third movie because yeah. like there, there's a lot to resolve. So I was totally fine with that. That's why after thinking about it, I was like, okay, I can yeah. kind of see the point. But Now this will be this will be truly spoilery, this bit here, if you guys have it. But like, the thing that bothered me about the movie and why I'm not... I've been recommending it to everybody, but I'm saying, like, for the animation alone. This is, like, a game changer. Yeah. Like, when you saw The Matrix for the first time, mm-hmm. you were like, what is what? this? It's like, even if you don't like The Matrix, I think you have to respect how game-changing mm-hmm. it was. I think that's what, this is the same thing. But I don't think my mom would like this movie. It's confusing as all hell. There's, like, Spider-Man from across the universe. There's, you know, all these characters. There's a lot going on. I thought that whole premise of, like, captains have to die was really dumb like uh they were saying gwen stacy's dad is going to die because he's going to accept the promotion as a captain and every spider-man in every universe loses a captain yeah and then when he decides that he's not going to accept the promotion she's like we changed the future i'm like that's so dumb it's literally just because he takes the title of captain and he has to die yeah he can't if he's a lieutenant and he dies that doesn't matter anymore like it just that seemed really dumb to me and Basically, the premise is the reason why Spider-Man 2099 is the villain is because he has accepted the fact, and basically so is every other Spider-Man in the multiverse that 2099 has recruited, they all concede to this, we have to follow fate, that we have to let these certain people die in our lives in order for things to play out the way they're supposed to happen. So Miles Morales doesn't want his dad to die because he's also going to become a captain. And they're like, you have to let your dad die. And he's like, I'm not going to let him. And they're like, well, then they try and capture him and hold him back so he can't rescue his dad. And I just don't buy into that at all. Because like I'm a fan of Spider-Man 2099. He's had his own comic book for like over you know 20 years he's been around. Or 30 years, I don't know. Um, I just don't believe that every Spider-Man would be 
would would buy into that. Same as even like Peter B. Parker, who was like you know Miles Morales' best friend. And I don't like that character very much. No. I think he's kind of goofy, but they portrayed him as like a real nice softy. And the fact that even he buys into this, like we have to let people die for fate to play out, it kind of goes against the whole great power, great responsibility. Like so. Uh, that was a major sticking point for me, but I'm kind of going super nerdy. Like, if I tried to tell that to, you know, my mom, about this is why it's not good, she'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, ah, yeah. But that was a sticking point for me, that in order to elevate Miles to be such a good hero, that you had to drag every other version of Spider-Man into the mud to do that, I didn't love that. But the chase scene was great, though. There were so many great scenes. Yeah. Like, let's say the story is where I've got some hang-ups. Mm-hmm. But visually, it was a non-stop, yeah. mind-blown. Love it. So, anyway, I'm going to do a, kind of a quick close-up review of him. We'll compare him to the old version. And then we'll be back to talk about the next movie. So, it's a couple of days later, and I'm shooting these insert shots. And I'm going to try to keep them very brief. Because me and Chad talked longer than I, than I anticipated about the movies. So, yeah, let's keep these nice and short. Here is a closer look at Spider-Punk. So I think you can see he's very stylized. He's got a lot of personality, like just the way his proportions are. Very skinny. This is why I was a little worried that these could break in time because yeah, the joints are so small. But like even just like this detailing. Like I'm not sure what's going on there, but it's just very, it's very cool. It's like very punk rock webbing. He's got this spray paint on the back of his jacket. He's got the suspenders hanging there. The guitar, you can see all the deco on the guitar with all these stickers and everything on it. It's very cool. I love the boots with the laces, kind of just haphazardly tied off halfway up the boot. Again, just very punk rock. I really like it. Uh, His only other accessory other than the guitar was an alternate hand, which is good for him. Like if you want him holding, you know, the guitar, he's actually kind of got his fingers like he's trying to fret on the guitar. But how could you not go with the rock on hand? And just for a comparison, I'll bring out the uh, previous Spider-Punk here. So he also had the rock on hand, which I thought was cool. But you can see just how, whoops, you can see how lame this guy is compared to the new one. He's just like, it's pretty much just Spider-Man with a couple little spikes on the head. He's got the jean jacket with the same logo. His guitar is just plain white, not very punk rock. And then he's got these like high top sneakers. Otherwise, it's pretty much a basic Spider-Man costume underneath. And so I think, yeah, just comparatively, this new one here is just a lot more fun. He takes a lot more chances. You know, he's his own thing rather than just feeling like a normal Spider-Man with a couple little details added on. I think he's awesome. So, yeah, really cool figure. I would strongly recommend it. Okay, so we're back. Now, this is a bit of a cheat. So we went and saw Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Which was an afternoon movie. Was it? Yeah, it was like 3.30. Oh, yeah, we went to a matinee that day. Um, anyway, I... One o'clock. Right. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> they don't care. Um, but uh, I did not buy any Rise of the Beast yeah. toys. I just so happened to have recently got this toy. This is Dirge. He is one of the Transformer Seeker Jets. He hangs out with Starscream. It is a repaint of a figure that we've already got a bunch of times... It's a figure that was released previously, but it was like a Target exclusive and very hard to get. I was never able to get my hands on it, so they re-released him. I was very happy to finally get him. Um, So he has nothing to do with the movie, Mm because this character does not appear in that movie. This is not under the Rise of the Beast banner. This is under the Legacy Evolution banner. However, since I do have just one new Transformer to talk about, um, I figured I could use him as a lead-in to talk about Rise of the Beasts. So, what are your thoughts on this one? Mixed bag. Um, This was also a long movie. Mm -hmm. And it definitely did seem very long at points. Um, Like, the story was... The story was not very great. Um, Now, humor me on this. So, the movie is called Rise of the Beasts. They had, what, four beasts in the movie. They had Optimus Primal. They had the Hawk. I forget the Hawk's name. Um, They had Cheetor. And there was the Rhinoceros. Yeah, Rhinox. 
and, and that was it. That were that were well. That would have been enough. I think. I think if they did anything, but mm-hmm. like they really didn't. Rhinox and Cheetor, I barely talk. I don't. I can't even say for certain. I think Cheetor had a couple lines, but Rhinox definitely did. Yeah, Rhinox say might have grunted or something. And they did transform into the robot modes in the final battle, but it was like a jump, you know, transformation right into a fight. Like there was never a single scene where Cheetor and Rhinox were standing in the robot mode talking that you could kind of process what they look like. Yeah, I don't know what they look like, so that's not great that you've got these brand new characters and they're not even going to stand still long enough for you to understand. Like, I don't know if Cheetor looks just like he did in the old show. Does he have a face? Maybe he has a you know, faceplate, you know, like, I don't know. I couldn't tell what was happening there. I think it focused way too much on the Autobots, first of all. For a movie called Rise of the Beast, yes. Yes. And the humans, I mean, they were, they were essential to the story, but I mean, I just want to see robots fight. Yeah. And I don't really care about the story that much. That being said, I would probably give it... A six and a half, maybe, out of ten. I think, like, the action when it was there was good. Um, the big thing for me was the ending. Because I just did not understand that. Oh, you get into your thoughts and then we can talk about the ending. Well, that's something why we kind of argue about the action. It's like, like, this felt to me like a huge step backwards into the Michael Bay stuff. Yes. Because I really liked Bumblebee, mm-hmm. the standalone movie. I thought the designs were looking a lot more Generation 1 inspired. I thought the human character... like For one, it's ba- it was basically a remake of the Iron Giant, which, yeah. I, which I adore that yeah. movie. So if you're gonna take he was that, no Hogarth, though. She... Was, what's her face in that one? Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, whatever. Can you remember? Yeah, that chick in Bumblebee. Yeah. She was fine. Um, and yeah, but it was the story of the Iron Giant. It worked really well. Um, you know, you got the spend time with the characters to get to know them. Um, the robots looked distinct enough so you knew when they were fighting what they looked like, everything. But the Michael Bay movies, it was just like a big mess of metal rolling around. You couldn't tell what was happening. Um, there was too many characters. There was some stupid MacGuffin to drive the plot. And this one went back to all those cliches. Like, oh, they need the... What was it this time? The, the It was the time... Let's call it the Infinity Stone. Like, whatever the fuck it was. It was a thing they needed. And... Time I, warp thing? Time warp key? I don't know. Yeah, the warp key. But, like, the first movie... and I, They're all just a big blur in my head because the storylines are incomprehensible. But, like, the first one, it was, like, the Allspark. Like, yeah. we need the Allspark. That's the all-powerful thing. And then the Allspark got destroyed or whatever. And then the second movie, they're like, we need the Matrix of Leadership or whatever. And then the third movie was like, now we need this thing. And now the fourth one was this thing. It's like, where? how come there's all these all-powerful things? Um, they just keep coming out of nowhere. I didn't understand what was happening in this movie. Like, the motivations of, like... It starts off with Unicron eating the Beast Wars planet. And he's like, I need the transformation key or whatever, the time key. And they're like, no, you can't have it. He's like, I need that to eat planets. But, like, why does he need that to eat planets? He's already here eating a planet. We didn't have the key before this. I don't understand why he needed it all of a sudden. They took it to Earth, and they hid it on Earth. And the humans found out, like, oh, if this key, if it gets into Unicron's hand, Unicron will come and eat our planet, so let's destroy it. And then Optimus Prime is like, no, don't destroy the key, because then the fate of Cybertron is sealed. And I was thinking, like, why? What happens to Cybertron? If the key gets destroyed. I don't even remember Cybertron being mentioned before. No. I knew Optimus Prime couldn't get home without it. But that's not worth risking the whole galaxy over. Like, let the kid destroy the thing. But he made it sound like his planet was in peril. And I'm like, I thought we've already established that Unicron can't eat any more planets until he gets this thing. Like, it didn't make any sense to me. It didn't. I didn't understand it. There was things, like a lot of really convenient plot devices. Like, at the end of the movie, there's like... The bad guys have this the thing, and the Autobots can't get to it. And they're like, there's a little tunnel that only a human could fit through, so you can go. And the human's like, perfect. And yet earlier in the movie, Mirage, Mirage like, I guess you could say it was a hologram or something where he turns into a garbage truck, but I don't think so because it seemed to have yeah, structure Yeah, it was to pretty it. elaborate. 
like the Transformers have shown that they can change their shape. And at one point, Mirage goes from a race car to a garbage truck, so he clearly can change his mass. And we've seen in the Michael Bay movies that they can be human shape. Mm-hmm. Um, like, why doesn't the Transformer just shrink and go down the tunnel himself? Like, the more I thought about this movie afterwards, the more it annoyed me, and I was like. This was just another dumb Transformers movie. I thought it was supposed to kind of follow Bumblebee with being a better mm-hmm. version yeah. of Transformers. But, Not the case. But this was just like a blur of stupid. Um, like, I thought maybe the coolest new Transformer, because I didn't really care for the big bad guy that much. Yeah. Scourge. Yeah. Which he does share a name with a G1 character, but it, this was not that Scourge no. at all. It was basically, they used the name only. But he had basically two henchmen. Some chick and some construction vehicle. I thought the construction vehicle guy looked cool. He was like orange and he had a big ball and chain and stuff. Do you know what his name was? I can't remember. I don't think they said it. No. I was listening for it. Because I was like, oh, is he supposed to be somebody? And I don't think they said his name the whole movie. No. So I'm like, that's dumb. You're trying to sell toys to, you know, like, tell me what the the character's name is so I can leave the theater being like, I can't wait to get Wrecker. But like, I don't know what his name is. So, yeah, it was... It wasn't awful. Like, I did actually like the main human character. I thought he was charming. Likeable, for He's sure. He's a likable guy. Um, I didn't really care for Pete Davidson as Mirage. Well, yeah, that was a weird matchup. Although he had a couple of good laughs. Because mm-hmm. I don't dis- I, I don't not like Pete Davidson. As a Saturday Night Live fan, I kinda, I'm always kind of rooting for SNL alum to go off and do things. But Pete Davidson's a little played out right now with all of his, you know just pop culture everywhere so i really wasn't in the mood for him in this movie he's okay but uh anyway i don't know if i have a whole lot more to say about this star for me and it was rc rc yeah yeah like she was cool like i thought most of the autobot designs like looked pretty good like i wish barrage was a little more close to his g1 but he wasn't that far off not far off um wheeljack was awful i hated yes i hated how wheeljack looked I also didn't care for this big airplane guy. <laughs> yeah, this random airplane that shows up way later after Optimus Prime is calling all Autobots. Which I didn't understand. Yeah, that's the thing. At one point, when this uh, time key first goes off and it sends a big beam into space that all the Transformers can see, Optimus Prime gets on the radio and he says, All Autobots come to me. And that's how... This kid, the main character, he's in the middle of trying to steal Mirage. Mm -hmm. And then Mirage comes to life because he has to go, you know, answer Optimus' call. And that's how the kid gets roped into this. But then, like, as the movie goes on, whenever they need a new Autobot for convenience purposes, like, oh, we're in Peru. We need an Autobot here to explain Peru to us. Then this Transformer shows up. Yeah. And they're like, how are we going to get to Peru? We don't have a... We can't fly. Well, don't worry. We know a big airplane. And an Autobot airplane comes. I'm like... Where were you guys when the call went out to all Autobots? Like, uh, (laughs) just they keep coming out of the woodwork. Um, I don't know. The movie was dumb. I don't know if we want to even bother talking about the big spoiler at the end. That one's still relatively new, June 9th, so I would say maybe not yet. Okay, I'll say this much. There is a kind of a weird twist at the end, which I did not know about before going to see the movie, and I don't really know how I feel about it. I would say I probably don't love it, especially seeing how I felt about this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, if you guys want to know more about how I think about it, you can say in the comments here. But I, yeah, I won't spoil it here just in case somebody hasn't seen the movie. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll do a little closer review of uh, Dirge here, and then we'll be back to talk about another movie. So here's a closer look at Dirge. And even though this toy really has nothing to do with the movie we just talked about, It's a really cool figure, and it deserves more than just two minutes to talk about. However, that's all I'm going to allow myself. We're going to be quick, because I've basically reviewed this figure at least three times already, because it's essentially just a repaint of uh, Thrust here. And then we've got Ramjet version 2, and then this guy here is like Sandstorm. And I've got a fifth one coming right now. I pre-ordered one that's kind of a baby blue colored. I think his name is uh, Cloud Cover. So yeah, that's the whole thing with these Seeker Jets is they're just basically repaints of one another. But uh, I always loved the Seekers. Back in the Generation 1 days, there was a group of six. 
And ever since then, I've been trying to have a consistent group of six in my collection, and it never works out. Either there's one that's really hard to find, or they just they don't make all six before they change the style of them. So I really wanted all six of the original Seekers. And I have the three non-Conehead versions, which is Skywarp, Thundercracker, and Starscream. So I have them all in a matching deco. Um, it doesn't quite match up with these guys because it's their Siege, like Cybertronian versions, whereas these guys do transform into like Earth Jets. So they don't quite line up. But in the robot mode, they all look pretty good together. Anyway, so when this figure came out previously as part of the like Earthrise line, it was in a two-pack with Ramjet. I really wanted it, but it was selling for like 200 bucks online. It was like a Target exclusive. We didn't get them here in Canada. So the dirge in my collection is this one here, which is still a great figure. This is from 10 or 15 years ago. And I really like this figure, but it is small. It's a little out of scale with the current Transformers I'm buying. So I've wanted to upgrade him so he would match my other Seekers. Finally got this guy. I'm pleased with it. Although the colors are really off. And I thought maybe they changed it from a blue to a purple for this new release. But apparently from what I read online, this is exactly the figure that came in the two-pack with Ramjet. So I guess I am a little disappointed with the colors. Because I always felt that Dirge was this much like richer blue. Whereas this guy definitely comes across as kind of purple to me. So that's my only real gripe about him. I do like that his head sculpt is unique from the other jets. I don't know if you can see that, but like these guys all have like closed mouths. He's got an open yelling mouth, which is kind of cool. Anyway, it's a cool transformer. Although I'll be honest, if they release this one again in a more traditional blue like this guy, I would probably buy it again. Okay. So the most recent movie we saw was the flash flash. And, uh, I think you had your hopes fairly high because you're you're a big DC guy. I am a DC guy too, but I have not liked a lot of the DC movies, so my expectations were pretty tempered. Mm -hmm. um, so the toy that we'll talk about, I actually went to Toys R Us the other day, and I picked up. Yeah, you did. I picked up Supergirl. So. Yeah, I've got Supergirl as she appears in the movie. So Kara Zor El. Um, the figure's okay. We'll talk about her. I'll do a close-up, and we'll get into a little more detail about the figure. Do you have any quick... Because you won't be here by when I'm shooting the others. Do you have any thoughts on her? And while you're looking at her, my brother just texted me. I'm going to see what he wants. Is this a McFarlane? Yep, yeah, of course. Uh, Todd. A couple things for me. You know, can I just say it's weird? My brother just texted me. I saw it come up on my screen. Brother Brian him. or Brother Doug? Brian. And he texted me. He's like, what did you think of The Flash? Did you see it yet? Well, he literally texted me that as we're here talking about The Flash. So, anyway, go on. Her joints are super loose. I don't know if I like... Even from McFarland's standards, like I don't want to play with the joint on it a lot because it'll wear it out. But the face looks... It's accurate, but it looks a little derpy. Yeah. To me. I, I don't know. Like, I think it's because I've been away from McFarland for so long now. Like, I'm not actively collecting him anymore. Yeah. Which does suck. Now, I that being said, I did pre-order two figures, but... Because, um, yeah, when we first started hanging out, you were pretty much strictly buying DC, DC Multiverse. And, yeah, you kind of got away from that. I'll get you on the G.I. Joe train now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I don't... I don't buy many of these myself, but um, I do like Supergirl. I've always been a Supergirl yeah. fan, and this was a unique take on Supergirl. It wasn't just another blonde Supergirl. Yeah, I, I already had three or four of them, and I liked the actress that played her. I thought she was cute. I thought she did a good job in the movie, so I thought, I'm going to buy this figure. I think when you see the figure statically, like she looked good when she's fighting in the movie, but here... It almost looks like she's wearing pajamas. It's like too much blue. Well, that diaper also doesn't do it for me because that looks really sloppy. Like, I realize it's part of a joint, but you could have found a better way to make that. It looks like she's wearing, like, really saggy underwear. Yeah, but just, like, so much blue. Like, if she had red boots or a red mm -hmm. belt or something, but it's just a lot of blue. And, yeah, the face, 
Like it, you can tell it's like a digital scan, which is what they do for a lot of actors. Like to get an actor's likeness now, they take like actual like a photograph and digitally. And I don't know what ethnicity Supergirl was, but I she seemed just like a white girl to me. But here she looks like she's like Latino. Latino. Or something. So I don't know what that is, why her like skin tone or why the digital print looks that way. So I almost didn't buy it. I kind of hummed and hawed about it in the store. And the main reason I did is like. I kind of had this idea for an episode where I'm like, we'll talk about a toy and then we'll talk about the movie. So I was like, I'll grab this toy. And this is it. So I'll talk about her in a little bit more detail, but you can see we're not like super thrilled with her. Were we super thrilled with the movie? Were we super thrilled about the movie? Do you want my comments first? Go for it. I've got a love-hate relationship with this movie. So I was on board with The Flash and then all the Ezra Miller stuff happened. They went through their crisis and... Whatever, there was so much back and forth, whether they were going to cancel it, they were going to re- recast and reshoot, um, and then all of a sudden, James Gunn takes over DC, and then I'm like, oh great, what are they going to do here? And there was rumors that he like cut out half of the, the crew there, and there had been teased cameos in the movie for alternate people, and I was like, oh, I really hope this this happens, so... yeah. Anyways, months and months without trailers, they re- revealed the first trailer back in March, I think, early March, and I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm coming along to this, but where is this going to fit in the new DC universe that James Gunn is spearheading? Yeah. <sighs> then when we went to see Across the Spider-Verse, they had a new Flash trailer in there, and I was like, okay... They're, they're pulling me back in a little bit. Mm-hmm. I did enjoy that trailer. My hopes weren't like super high for the movie. Um, there was a lot of like premieres and people that got to see the movie before it released. Like James Gunn specifically said, this is the best fucking superhero movie I've ever seen in my life. End quote. Yeah. And a couple others were like, oh man, this was fantastic. For me... I'd struggle to give it a seven. I would say I was leaning between a six and a half and a seven, but I think I'll cut down the middle and give it a six point seven five out of ten. Okay. That's that's not good. It's not terrible. Um, I could have easily shaved probably forty five minutes off that movie worth of nonsensical jumble. Um, yeah. Specifically at the beginning, like animation. I think since this only came out like five days ago, maybe not give too many spoilers. Yeah. But like the animation sequences at the beginning were kind of weird. Um, Parts in the middle of the movie didn't really do it for me. And the action, I will say when they got into the the fighting, Mm -hmm. it was good. Um, I just don't like how it ended. And there was... Too many weird things in it. Like, there were some good cameos. I was correct about one of them, for sure. Mm. Um, that happened at the end. Won't say anything. Um, other than that, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on it. I don't think it was everything that they hyped it up to be. Yep, I'm, I'm a DC fan. I agree that it would, as far as the ranking, like... I'll go with a 6.752. Why not? Okay. Um, because, like, I don't know, it was fun in yeah. tone for a lot of it, but that's a little jarring compared to the Snyderverse that we're coming out of. Like, it's always been so dark, mm-hmm. even though Flash was kind of a humorous character in there. Like, I just don't, totally, this was a little weird. Um, the animation for sure was seemed like it was not done. It seems like it needed another yeah. month or two of work. Now, there was part of it that I could kind of let slide, which is every time he, like, when he ran, whenever that he broke... stupid, like, speed well, skating pose? Well, I actually kind of... Dug, I actually like when he ran. Like, that first scene when he has to get to, like, Gotham City and stuff yeah. and how that's portrayed, I thought that was cool. And it didn't just feel like Quicksilver again. Yeah. Like, they kind of put their own spin on it. But... Like, when he goes into the Speed Force. Because basically, if you've seen the trailer, you know he goes back in, like, time. Yeah. And he runs so fast that he goes... Anyway, there is... When he goes so fast and, the t- and like, the real world kind of falls away from him, he goes into this, like, 
alternate dimension. T- the time and in the time force, he sees all these events that have happened to him. So you see the scenes from previous movies. You see the scenes that happened to him just earlier in this movie, and uh, so because this is supposed to be an alternate, like weird reality, I'm like, I guess I could let it slide that it looks so stupid in there. But I don't know, was it a conscious choice that it first looked stupid, or they just don't have enough time to finish the effects? Because they will shoot a scene with him and his mom and dad, you know, a minute ago, and then he goes into Speed Force, and to show that he's going through time, they'll show that same scene, like, again, but moving backwards or something. Mm-hmm. But it looked like it was, like, animated with, like, yeah. construction paper or something. Like, you already have the footage. Why didn't you use the footage? Why has it got this weird animation filter? Why do they look fake and weird... Like, I really didn't like the effects in there. The facial distortions, too, were kind of weird. Yeah, and that opening scene, there's a big action scene where he's got to save a bunch of civilians. And clearly the people look fake. Mm -hmm. Like, unbelievably fake. And I'm kind of thinking, like, it was so goofy, that opening action scene. And I'm not even saying that that was bad. I'm like, it felt like I was watching a Saturday morning cartoon. It was bad. (laughs) But, like... (laughs) Yeah, the, ki- the the people looked so fake as he was grabbing them in like slow motion and stuff. I was like, I don't know about this. Um, yeah, so the effects, I was really like, I couldn't believe how goofy they look. The CG of the two Ezra Millers on screen mm-hmm. together, because he goes you know, back in time, he finds his younger self, they team up. The whole movie, it's almost always two Ezra Millers on screen. I thought that looked great. I thought that looked really believable. When, uh, you know, at one point he's like carrying himself and... I'm like, this totally looks like there's two different people here. They have different hairstyles and all this stuff. It really, really worked for me. I thought Ezra Miller, despite what he's like in real life, was great in this movie. I thought the way he acted off of himself was, like, really fun. Um, The outfit's still a little hokey. Mm -hmm. I I feel the same way about Captain America and the MCU universe, too. Whenever he puts his cowl on, it just doesn't... It looks a little goofy. This flash looks a little goofy. When the two Flashes both had Flash costumes on, it seems like they played it for laughs for him to like, look, my costume doesn't fit right. But then they made him wear that for like the whole third act, and I'm like, he looks like an asshole. Like, it's really tight in the dick. <laughs> yeah, there was a couple of funny jokes. Yeah. There. there was some good laughs in there. Um, but like, why would they take the second Flash and make him look like a goofball? Like, I just love, well, that being said, though, I love how he made it out of an old bat suit. Like, well, he did. That's the thing. So they go back. They're in a different time, and only well, there's only one Flash costume. So they go see Michael Keaton's Batman, you know, and Michael Keaton gives him one of his old bat suits, and he basically cuts the ears off of it. He paints it red. He puts a lightning bolt over top of the bat, and then it's a laugh when he comes out. Look, check me out, and it doesn't fit right. It's all weird on face. And I get that for a laugh, but then they should have said like, take another try, and then come back out, and he has something cool on yeah. that you would want to buy an action figure of. But no, instead he's wearing this goofy, misshapen, with the ears kind of half ripped off. Like, he looks stupid. Yeah. And I'm like, this is like the star of the movie. And you're making him run around in an awful, stupid-looking costume for, like, the whole last 40 minutes of the movie. I was like, what is going on here? Um, also, the big bad. I didn't really know where this movie was going to go. Like, if you again, if you've seen the trailer, you know Zod comes back. Mm-hmm. He was the bad guy in Man of Steel. Because... The Flash has run back in time, so I thought, oh, they're going to relive the events of the DC Universe, sort of like what they did in Avengers Endgame. They went back in time, and they had to relive all these different events that have happened. But they didn't do that. Instead, they're just like, oh, we're back in time. Now Zod is attacking. And then that was the whole movie. Like, them fighting Zod was like, basically, that was the main bad of the movie. That's the whole plot they had to resolve. And I didn't like that Zod fight the first time I saw it in Man Mm -hmm. of Steel. So I didn't really want to watch it again. Um, it felt like really, like really, we're doing this again. We're in the same desert location as when they first attacked in the first movie. They're still doing that. What's that machine that's dropping everybody, smashing everybody around? It's like really, this is what we're going to spend the whole movie on is this thing. So, yeah. Mm. Now, <clears throat> I think. What I enjoyed most about that movie was seeing Keaton back in the bat suit. Like, yes, that was he's fun. he's my Batman because he's the first, aside from Adam West, he's the first Batman that I remember in the movies. 
Uh, yeah. My dad took me to see that in 1989 when it came out. So he was always my Batman. He had a special place in it. Just seeing him get back into it. He's older. He's retired. But he's he's still capable. Like he's got his yep. he's got its faults. Um, but when they started playing like the Danny Elfman music from the original movie, it just brought back a lot of nostalgia for me. I I really enjoyed that and getting to see Ben Affleck still as Batman. Although his sequences were kind of weird in that movie, I I don't know how I feel about them. But just being able to see Ben in that bat suit one more time, yeah. Um, Apparently well, he's may, done. Maybe. Well, who knows? He's done, officially, um, so they say. But I I enjoyed seeing him. But we both agreed because yeah, he, Ben Affleck shows up and he's wearing kind of the classic blue and gray. Yeah, like kind of the Adam West Batman outfit, yeah. which is really cool. Um, except his nose looked like it was broken. The, the cowl had like this big smushed flat wide yeah. nose. He had this weird five o'clock shadow, and he didn't even really sound like Ben Affleck in some parts. I don't know if it was just the enhanced sound or if it was you know the the audio on it. But this is a minor. Com- we saw it in a, what was the AVX I think. AVX theater, which I don't think I've ever been to before. That was really loud. And yeah, this is so. This isn't the Flash's fault, but like, I didn't. Maybe I'm just an old man, but I was like, this is too friggin' loud. It was because it stands for enhanced audio yeah. visual or something. So I guess the screen was maybe a bit bigger. It's not IMAX, but it's bigger than usual. That was fine. But yeah, it was so loud in there. Yeah. I was thinking like, man, I need earplugs for this movie. But uh, yeah, like it was cool seeing Michael Keaton again. Um, and it was cool that he could do more stuff because in the original movies... His suit was so stiff he couldn't stiff turn his rigid, head yeah. that his the best move he could do was kind of like this kind of stuff. Yeah. But here he's doing stuff. He's flipping guys. Sometimes it almost was almost too far because watching those first two movies with Michael Keaton, you almost believe that maybe that's his fighting style. Yeah. He's very rigid and very abrupt because he's so good at fighting. He only needs to make keep yeah. minimal movements. So when they start having him like flying around and doing triple axle kicks and stuff, I'm like, this is almost like seeing Yoda jump around to it's like eh, it's a little yeah, it's, it's a little much a little too CGI for me but it was cool seeing him get to actually do some yeah. stuff um, it was great seeing him again um, so yeah that was really well done it, not everything with him was perfect I thought when they introduced him that was weird yeah like when they find him he's all kind of old and retired he's got the big gray beard and stuff I didn't really love that Batman had turned into this weird eccentric slob. hermit slob and also he was way too smart like they show up the two flashes, and they're like, and he's like, why do you guys look the same? They're like, we're from the multiverse. And then he immediately starts explaining the Talking multiverse. Talking with noodles. He's like, so this is an actual center line, and then this happens, and then, like, although the noodles are touching, they're curving away from each other, and he's, like, throwing spaghetti sauce on the plate, and I'm like, what is going on here? How yeah. does he know so much? Yeah, like, we needed that exposition, because Flash is saying, like, I went back in time to change my past. How come you, Batman... Are a wholly different person. Like you don't look like Ben Affleck. You're different. and he's like because when you went back in time, you didn't just change the future. You changed the past. And he's using yes noodles to show how. And I'm like, how does he have all this knowledge of how the multiverse works? Um, so that was a little strange. But once we get through the exposition and he get the beard off and he was just back to being Batman, then he he killed yeah, it. Yeah. Great great job as Batman. Um, but yeah, overall the movie was kind of just a little little busy, a little much. The spotty CGI was kind of hard to look past. Um, I wouldn't say don't go. Like, if you like going to see action movies and, like... It was still... I still had a fun time. Yeah. Maybe if we weren't... Because we were there till like, 1 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. My brother um, doesn't typically watch these kind of movies. So, yeah, we went with his brother. He enjoyed it. Which, yeah. to me, is like, oh, wow, okay, well... Good. Yeah. At least it wasn't a total, total letdown for someone. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't discourage you from seeing it, but I also wouldn't go in with high hopes. I don't know. It's it's making me really nervous for Blue Beetle. Yeah, I don't have high hopes for that one. Well, anyway. no, he's my favorite non-mainstream character, so... Yeah. Just well, sex for you then. Don't destroy it. All right, so that's enough on Flash. So I'll cut in a little review of Supergirl here and we'll be back because we have one more thing to talk about. So here's a closer look at Supergirl. So now you can really get a good look at the kind of face sculpt 
the face like paint job and like it's good like I think it looks like a real person but I just don't really know if it captures the look of that actress um, anyway I don't know how I feel about it anyway I thought like the actress was very cute that played her um, I don't know if it really comes across in the figure and uh, I thought she looked good like her outfit and everything looked good on the screen but here, once I see it in figure form, it does, it's just too much blue to me. Like, I feel like you can see there's like some sort of deco on the side here. Like maybe these were intended to be boots. Like if the boots were red or here's that big kind of rubbery diaper that Chad was talking about, it doesn't bother me as much. It's made out of like a softer plastic than like the rest of her. Um, but anyway, if that was red, I don't know if that would improve this or not. I actually don't think so. I really think maybe just some red boots and maybe a belt would have helped a lot. Like, yeah, a yellow belt across there would really break up all that blue. Anyway, her cape, it's, uh, you know, it's got some pliable, kind of a pliable rubbery plastic. Uh, it does kind of get in the way, though. It is a little tough to get her to stand up properly because of the heavy cape. Uh, her only accessory was a flight stand, so we should be able to get her in some flight poses. So here she is in flight mode. Which is cool. It works pretty well, I think. The stand is uh, is pretty strong, and it, it seems like it's going to hold her up. I'm not worried about her toppling over, which is good. However, at the same time, most DC figures come with this little display base like this. Now, they're not my favorite display bases because they're only big enough for basically one foot. I always find them a little small. However, they do tend to do a pretty good job. All my other DC Multiverse figures have one little display base, and it tends to keep them standing. Now, I don't know if I'm going to display Supergirl flying because it does take up a lot more room on the shelf. So I wish that she also came with one of these standard little bases just in case I chose to display her just standing rigidly. But uh, anyway, that would have been an easy thing for McFarland to do. But I understand maybe two different display bases is asking a lot. But anyway, yeah, it's not a bad figure. Um, it's an okay figure from an okay movie. Anyway, let's move on. So we're back. And so those are the movies that we have seen. Now the reason I'm lumping this in here is because I got a new figure for a movie that's coming out in like two weeks. June as, 28th. And uh, you and I will not be seeing it no. together because it was just Father's Day. Uh, I promised my dad that we would go see it together. So I have a date with my dad for dinner and a movie. We're going to go see Indiana Jones and the... What is it? The Tablet of Time or the... <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. With something it's or looking for something. So, it's a tablet. So I got the new Indiana Jones figure from Hasbro. There's a whole line of these. Um, so the first wave, I think all the figures from the first wave are all from Raiders of the Lost Ark. So this is Raiders, Indiana Jones. Then there was uh, Marion, his girlfriend. Then there's Salah, his buddy. Then there's Tot, the Nazi guy. And then, uh, what's the last dude's name? Anyway, the guy that's working with the Nazis to find the Ark of the Covenant. And if you buy all the figures, you get to build a figure pieces to build the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of cool. Um, so I bought Indiana Jones. He came with just the little handles for the Ark. Um, I love Indiana Jones. They're some of my favorite movies. I don't know if I need to buy all the characters. Because they've already shown the figures that are coming out for all the movies. So there's like three or four waves of these planned. But you're getting his buddy, uh, Marcus Brody. You're getting the bad guy from the third movie. You're getting his niece from the new movie. You're getting multiple Indiana Jones. Some of them with his jacket off. Some of them with it on. It's got him with shirtless from Temple of Doom. Um, you're getting short round, his little sidekick from Temple of Doom. And they're just... Like, all the bad guys are just guys in suits. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not the most exciting characters to get. Now, Indiana Jones, I'm excited to get him. I've never had an Indiana Jones, ever. Um, me and my older brother, Doug, were both huge Indiana Jones fans. My brother has accumulated a few Indiana Jones over the years. I think he's got a couple of the Lego sets that came out, probably when uh, Crystal Skull came out. Yeah. So he's got Lego Indy. He also has a 12-inch doll that some company put out. Not like a really high-end one, but kind of like probably a $45, $50, or 12-inch one that, you know, Gave him an Indiana Jones in his collection. I, however, have never had an Indiana Jones. So this is my first one. I think it's a really cool figure. 
Um, I don't know how I feel about the new movie. I we haven't seen it yet. Obviously, I'm hoping it's good, but uh, realistically, uh, like Crystal Skull was not great. Yeah, it got terrible reviews. But again, the new one. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't trust reviews because I don't always agree with them, and you know, I. I don't know. There's lots of movies that reviewed poorly that I enjoyed, and lots that re- the, reviewed highly. The and I didn't. Dial of Destiny. That's what. The it's Dial of Destiny. That's yeah. right. Now, <clears throat> is Brother Doug going with you and your dad? I don't know. It might turn into a bigger thing because, like, even my wife Vanessa, she does not care about this stuff, but she uh, she likes to participate. So she'll go to Marvel movies with me. Um, but she doesn't really care if she sees them. She doesn't care about Godzilla movies or Star Wars movies. She goes. And I think Chad has taken a big burden off her shoulders because now she, she didn't have to go see Transformers. She didn't have to see Flash. <laughs> but Indiana Jones, um, like she, one of her passions is like archa- archaeology yeah. and yep. stuff. So she actually does like Indiana Jones movies. Um, so I think she kind of wanted to see it. So I might bring her with my dad. And then I mentioned it to Brother Doug, and Doug's like, well, my kids and my wife want to see it, so I can't go without them. So now it might be a whole family affair. Okay, that's okay. I'll just go by myself. Um, <laughs> here's another flap. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's really me, annoying. I got this figure before. I got... Well, for those of you who just joined us for this episode, we shot an episode previous tonight about reviewing some G.I. Joe figures. And some of the G.I. Joes, I think it was Copperhead, Yeah, he's got a holster... With this weird little strap that won't close. And Indiana Jones has the same strap. And I got Indiana Jones first. I've had this figure for a few weeks. And that strap has been annoying the hell out of me. So when I saw the same thing on Copperhead. I was like, not this again. Um, He just popped his hand up. Which is okay. He does have a couple of interchangeable hands. Uh, He also came with the little like fertility idol. From the opening scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. The little gold thing. Um, I'll show you guys all that when I do a cutaway. But uh, yeah! wrong movie. <laughs> oh, uh, which, which movie are you doing? <laughs> Return of the Jedi, where he got his hand cut off. Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wrong character. Wrong too, character. Wrong movie. Yeah. I know. I just thought. Plus, was... nobody nobody watching this can see that little. Yeah. Suit. But uh, yeah. So yeah, he's got uh, he's got some fun accessories. I think the likeness is pretty good. Yep. It doesn't bother me, but my brother Doug bought the same figure. My brother Doug actually bought the whole line, so he, he so he can build his little arc. Um, but he was kind of annoyed. He was like, "Why doesn't his hat come off?" Um, and that's a fair complaint because, like, all the GI Joes that we review, their helmets come off. Mm-hmm. Why doesn't his hat come off? I don't know. But there are multiple Indiana Joneses coming out. Um, I think some of them don't have a hat, like the Professor version of him, when he's he doesn't have a hat. The Temple of Doom. One doesn't have a hat, so you can probably mix and match parts if you want Indiana Jones without his hat on this body. Um, I don't know how many Indiana Joneses I will buy. Like I said, I'm not sure I'll buy any of the secondary characters. I could be tempted to buy Indiana Jones maybe from a couple of the other movies. I might buy his uh, his dad when they do the Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Um, and you know what? Even though Crystal Skull was bad, I wouldn't mind... If not the Crystal Skull version of Indiana Jones, maybe the Dial of Destiny version, to have him as a young man and an old man. Yeah. Uh, because I have that in my Han Solo collection. I have the Han Solo f- Black Series figure from the original trilogy and from the prequel, or from the uh, sequel trilogy. So it'd be kind of nice to have the same in my indie collection. But overall, he's a cool figure. Like, uh, he's got some interesting articulation. Well, the articulation is normal, but see how his knees are done? Like, he's kind of like the pegs. Yeah. Um, so it's different than. Uh, Marvel Legends and G.I. Joe's. I don't know how I feel about which that. Which is weird because he's by Hasbro. Like Probably a lot yeah. of the same designers working on this line. Um, you guys can't really see that from here, but I'll put in a close-up here at the end. So, uh, yeah, we've probably already ran pretty long. Is there anything more you have to say on this guy? Not really, no. I, I like him. That's my only opinion. Did you grow up as a big Indiana Jones fan? Um, the first... Three, yes. Yeah. Well, that's the same as that's, everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't... What maybe, was your favorite of the original trilogy? Uh, probably Raiders. Okay, yeah. Like, I really liked The Last Crusade too, but 
my love of that is because I'd already been such a huge fan of mm-hmm. Raiders, and I'd probably seen Raiders a million times yeah. by the time I by the time I saw uh, Last Crusade. Um, so yeah, Raiders is just there's so many great scenes and like the whole movie. I, I don't think there's a bad scene in it. It's just it's a really fun movie. It's a great character. Uh, yeah, it's a cool figure. So I'm gonna do a quick close up of this guy, and we'll be back to say goodbye. So here's a closer look at Indiana Jones. It's been a couple of days since me and Chad uh, sat down to talk about this figure. I still haven't seen the movie yet. It's not out yet, but me and my dad will probably go in about five days from now. So hopefully I'll have some thoughts on the movie, maybe in the next episode. Uh, But yeah, the figure's pretty cool. Like, I think the closer you get, the kind of the worse the the likeness is. But, you know, from a distance and everything, I think it, it looks pretty good. At six inches, I still think you're asking a lot if you want, like, photorealistic to look just like the actor. Uh, and that's pretty tough to do at this scale. But uh, I think it looks pretty good. Um, so these are some of the things I was complaining about. Like, this little holster, you're supposed to be able to fold that and tuck that back in there. That's a really hard thing to get to stay. Um, what else does he get there? He's got a little satchel there. He's got his whip. Um, this is the articulation we were talking about so it's kind of different rather than seeing like two pins or like if i bring a gi joe out here like a gi joe's got like a double jointed knee so i don't know why they changed up their style like from one figure to the next i don't really know which looks better kind of looks like shipwreck here has like knee pads on almost whereas him i don't know like it seems to work okay like he has a decent range of uh of motion in his leg but yeah I don't know. I'm just curious as to why they changed up the articulation for these figures. But, uh, yeah, he's pretty cool. Um, Accessories-wise, I've got them all in a little baggie here. So you see he's got some extra hands. He's got an extra whip that can be uh, just plugged into his belt. There's his little idol from the opening scene of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And these are the handles of the Ark of the Covenant. So you have to get the other figures in the wave to build the whole Ark. Now, one thing I did do since me and Chad shot our video, I mentioned that I was thinking of getting a few more Indiana Jones figures, perhaps one from each movie. Well, I was out yesterday, and I bought the Indiana Jones from the new movie. So this is the one from the Dial of Destiny. You can tell that because his hair is gray now. But uh, I bought them, and I got them home, and when I opened them up, I realized these figures are very, very similar. I'm like, did I really need to buy the two of them? If they had had this figure still in the store when I was there looking at this one, I probably would have noticed how similar they were, and I probably would have passed. But this figure wasn't here in front of me, so I was like, yeah, they're probably different enough. But nope, they're very, very similar. Which, you know, shouldn't really be a surprise. You know, Harrison Ford or Indiana Jones basically wears the same outfit every movie, but uh, I just thought they'd be a little more different. But anyway, his satchel is off to the opposite side than the other one. He has a whip that is uh, folded up on his belt. He does not come with an extended whip. Instead, he comes with this little flashlight, which I'm sure he uses in the new movie. And then he's got this uh, backpack, which you can remove from him. You kind of strap that over his arms. And he's got, uh, I don't even know if this stuff is removable in there. He's got a rope and some tools and stuff. So yeah, they're both good figures. I think I probably would have been fine with one or the other in my collection. Not necessarily both. Even with this one with the gray hair being an old man, I would still be, I think, okay if this was the only Indiana Jones in my collection because it looks enough like the classic Indiana Jones from my childhood. So yeah, I don't know if I'll be buying any more of these figures. Maybe I'll wait and see if they go on sale at some point later in the year. But uh, yeah, they're good. I'm happy I have at least one of them. I'm fine with having two, and I'm still excited to see this movie. I've heard some not-so-great things from early reviews and stuff, but I'm trying to avoid those. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed that it's good. So that is our review of some random Indiana Jones, Flash, Transformers, and Spider-Verse figures. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Leave us comments. Yeah, Uh, anything more you want to add? All right, well, that's it for this episode. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Ciao. Keep collecting.